So on today's episode of the Health Collective podcast, we're talking with Hannah Studley, who has recovered from three violent attacks, severe injuries, and 10 years of debilitating PTSD before going on to win an Academy Award. She has turned her experience and insights into best-selling novels, and she now speaks with us today on how she made that turnaround in her life. Some of the key points that really stand out for me are talking to her about the mind-body connection and how actually all of our thoughts and feelings are fleeting moments. And as long as we can understand how to allow them to move on without being caught, we don't need to be suffering through the chronic pain again. Hope you enjoy today's episode. So hi and welcome to today's episode of the Health Collective podcast. As I've already said, we are uh, joined by the wonderful Chana Studley and she is here today to talk about her own experiences, but also some advice and guidance that she can help all of you on in terms of your bodies, whether it be chronic pain, whether it be your minds and how we process certain feelings and thought processes, Um, but equally various different things that may have happened in your past that are still holding you back from achieving the future that you desire. So first of all, a massive thank you and welcome uh, to the show. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Mm -hmm. So what I'd love to do is you've got quite an interesting background, I think would be one (laughs) word. So I'd love if you wouldn't mind sharing some of what led you to this point and some of the pivotal moments uh, in your life that have led you here and and why you focus on the areas that you do today. Sure. So um, just a quick little bit of background. I grew up in England and um, I I went to Manchester University where I studied textiles. So I thought my career was going to be in something creative. I knew it was going to be something using my hands. I I have gifts with my hands. And I moved down to London afterwards and started working in the theater. So I kind of had two careers because I was working in the entertainment business. And I also trained as a coach back in in Manchester. So I kind of had these two careers. One has been going in the entertainment business, which took me from uh, West End um, Theater in London, um, doing museums um, to then studying movies. And I had a 20 year career doing special effects in movies, which then took me to California. So I lived in in Los Angeles for for about 16 years. But in between those projects, I was always doing coaching and counseling with people because not every movie has the kind of special effects I was doing. I I was known for making copies of real animals. I I did animatronics. Um, I worked for Jim Henson's Creature Shop a lot of the time. So we're doing very sophisticated puppets. And then in between those movies, I would work with um, different organizations doing counseling with people with trauma and addictions and relationship problems, all kinds of things. So it really kept my feet on the ground. You know, one minute I'm working with Eddie Murphy or John Travolta. And then then a couple of days later, I'll be, you know, at the Boys and Girls Club helping kids with their homework. (laughs) So it was it was um, it was actually a really great, great thing. So that continued for probably 20, 25, almost 30 years. And. one thing I've left out is that at the, in my early 20s, I, um, I was mugged three times. I suffered a lot of trauma in my early 20s and I had some severe injuries. My skull was fractured in the first one. My, my neck was broken. Uh, C2 and C3 were cracked through. And I, in, in the second one, my, I, I was slammed on the ground by three men who tapped me out of nowhere. And, and um, I have three herniated discs in my back. So whilst I was working on movies and coaching people and doing all these fun things, I would have these massive pain flare ups. I was, um, I had a walking stick by the time I was 27 years old. I was, you know, I would sometimes these flare ups would bend me sideways and forward. I I would describe myself as uh, Audrey Hepburn on one side and Marilyn Monroe on the other side. I I mean, my body would get that twisted. And I was actually rushed to hospital several times, paralyzed, not being able to move my body from my chest down, which is quite frightening. Thank God it was temporary, but you know, when it's happening, you don't know that. So <clears throat> I was continuously battling this body that was always letting me down. And it wasn't just the muscular stuff and the pain in the um, my back and legs. I had IBS, I had chronic allergies, um, asthma, um, you know, like so many different mind body um, things were going on. Only I never understood what it was about. I just thought, you know, this specialist, that specialist, homeopathy, 
um, journaling, writing, you know, I just kept trying all kinds of self-helpy things to fix it. And then, you know, traditional medical stuff, alternative medical stuff um, until about seven or eight years ago when I came across a new paradigm in psychology, which I'm so happy to tell you guys about. And all my pain went away. All my um, asthma, my IBS, everything went away. And so I got very curious about the connection between the mind and the body, started doing research and writing books. And so that kind of brings me to where I am now. <laughs> okay. So a lot of curiosity about your story and, you know, you mentioned names like Murphy and Travolta and, you know, that sparks a lot of almost this sort of fairy tale ideal. The word Hollywood evokes a feeling in people um, of light and airy and everything's, you know, hunky-dory and fantastic. <laughs> and then actually, <clears throat> as you describe it, those traumas, which were huge, especially as a, a female uh, being attacked by a male I think this is unfortunately in today's society something that's been normalized oh of course he hurt me of course he lifted you know we have these internalizations now that it's almost accepted that explains the physical trauma of being with walking stick talk to me a little bit about the asthma the IBS these are not explained directly by being mug so what was the indirect link between the other health conditions and the the physical trauma that you went through that's a great question it's very perceptive of you <laughs> i'm very impressed <laughs> um well at, at the beginning when they were happening i didn't make the connection um obviously so as i got to understand how the mind works and what i've learned is that we are always feeling our thinking. We, we live in a thought created world 100% of the time. So I see all of those physical things, whether it was the back pain, the IBS, the allergies, the asthma, they were all um, signals. They were the way my body was trying to get my attention. Now, I, when I would tell an osteopath or a chiropractor or the, my doctor about, you know, what was going on, and then I'd give them medical history, they'd say, oh, well, you know, the reason your arm is numb is because the nurse for your arm come out of your neck where, where your neck was broken, or, well, you have these allergies because there's something wrong with your sinuses. And I've since learned that, um, uh, in fact, I learned this from Dr. Sarno. I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Sarno, but um, after all my pain went away, someone suggested I read his books. And I got an incredible amount of insights just from reading his books in that all injuries heal. So like you said, all the, the, the structural stuff, those injuries had healed, but I was still having pain from them. So the, the difference between the allergies and the IBS and the chronic pain, actually, I don't see a difference now. Like when they were originally happening, there was a structural reason for it. You know, if you've if you're got three herniated discs, they're gonna heal. But my allergies went on for 50 years from when I was a small child until a few months ago. And I, sorry, a few years ago. And I'm actually allergic to olive trees. And, and right now I'm sitting in Jerusalem. I'm in the Middle East. You can't go for more than two meters without bumping into an olive tree. And I'm not sneezing after a lifetime of it. And I think all of it is because my thinking slowed down. Whilst I was going through life not feeling safe and I don't necessarily mean danger either because I got over the PTSD stuff a long time ago but not feeling safe in terms of um you know making a mistake being perfect got to do the right thing you know like in, in my job it, like it was very competitive working in Hollywood so you know as soon as I didn't want to do it you know there were 20 people who'd want to take my job you know so I was always you know had to do it perfectly can't make a mistake so all of that um, information is kind of sending danger messages to the brain. I, I've learned now that the brain kind of, well, it doesn't speak English, doesn't speak French or Spanish or Hebrew or anything else. It has to rely on my five senses for information. So if the information it's getting from my sensing the world is wrong, something's wrong, something's going to go wrong, then that interprets that as danger, puts me into fight or flight, and sets off all these other physical reactions. Now, why some people get allergies and some people get migraines and some people get IBS and other people get, you know, foot pain. 
I asked a medical doctor that once who specializes in mind body chronic pain. He said, we don't know. And to be quite honest, I don't think it really matters in terms of understanding it. All I need to know is my body is screaming at me. My body screamed at me for years and I didn't understand. But then once I started to, like seeing that my thinking was going way too fast and I was scaring myself with my own thinking, then the pain kind of disappeared. The IBS disappeared because it, it wasn't needed anymore. It's interesting the way that you describe it. And one of the things that we talk about a lot is how the body is just trying to send us a message. Pain is actually not the enemy. Pain is exceptionally useful. Right. Whether that's pain in the sense of being afraid, being angry, physical pain, uh, whether it's guilt, rejection, these are all feelings that most of us try and either distract from or numb ourselves from, rather than hearing the fact that there is a message that we need to listen to, telling us to usually change either our behavior or our belief, one of, one of the two. So what was it that happened in your life that triggered the realization that these were messages? What was it that led, because a lot of women, people will go through their life never knowing that that's a message. So what happened that taught you to listen? Yeah, well, I think it was, coming across this, this new paradigm in psychology that I mentioned earlier, it's, it's called the three principles. And I had been in the self-help, you know, personal transformational world for 30 years. And I tried everything, Course in Miracles. I, I have a diploma in Enneagram Diagnostics. You know, I'd done a ton of meditation. You know, in California, there was everything you could possibly think of, you know, doing silent retreats in Santa Barbara. And now we're off listening to Marianne Williamson. And, you know, people got a bit red string around their wrists and they're writing and journaling. And, you know, there was plenty. And I, I prided myself on being a searching kind of person. I realize now that I wasn't very good at it because I, I searched for 30 years. <laughs> I've stopped searching. Because you see, all of those techniques and methods and modalities, they were all um, they were all pointing at a misunderstanding. And the misunderstanding is that there's something wrong with my thinking. Now, I had got to the place where I realized the problem wasn't out there. You know, for years I was trying to fix the boyfriend, the job, you know, like the the you know, the politics, you name it. If only they would behave, then I'd be okay right? Lose a few pounds, get a better job, whatever it was, you know, we all have things that we think is going to make it better. And I got to the place where I realized that that's not where the problem is. The problem was in my thinking. Mm -hmm. So I got very expert at like thought hygiene, right? <laughs> Wasn't allowed any, you know, if you have a negative thought, you know, here's a technique, a tool to get rid of that, get rid of that, which is exhausting. So mm -hmm. the real pivot for me was when I had this massive insight when I realized um, from these new teachers that I, I found where I, I learned that thought is always moving mm. thought is a spiritual energy and I have no idea what I'm saying right now I usually start moving my hands around when we start talking about spiritual energy because who knows what that is right <laughs> but it's this kind of formless spiritual energy that we are blessed with and as it comes through my mind my little screen of consciousness it takes a form now that form might be a thinky thought, like do the laundry and no, I don't want to walk the dog. You know, those kind of like thinky thoughts, we have millions of them all day long. It can also take the form of sounds. Like if you can hear something, there might not be any words, but it's still coming through that spiritual energy. I'm experiencing it, um, sight um, and also sensations. And then when I realize pain has no substance, you know, there's tons of research to back this up, like, you know, phantom limb pain is the classic example, you know, if someone ha doesn't have, uh, you know, an arm or a foot, and they're still experiencing itchiness or pain or, or, you know, something in that limb that's missing, clearly the pain isn't happening in the hand, it's happening in, in the brain. So everything is this kind of, um, I, I want to say special effect, which is how people often ask me, how did I go from doing special effects in movies to, you know, coaching people with chronic pain? Well, our brain has the most brilliant special effects department, better than anything or me and Steven Spielberg could come up with. And so when I saw that if 
every thought I've ever had has moved on. Every broken heart, every frustration, every anxious thought, every joy, like good thoughts as well, it's constantly moving. Then I don't actually have to do anything to feel better. I just need to be aware. And so when I become aware, like sometimes it's um, like a physical thing. Like if, you know, I often ask my clients, where can you feel that anxiety? And they usually go like this or, you know, their gut or their chest or their throat. Like, what if you knew that was the wisdom of your body telling you to stop, telling you to slow down, telling you you're looking in the wrong direction? So my, I can still get the odd twinge every now and again, but it's just a message. It's like tapping me on the shoulder, telling me to stop and slow down. It doesn't turn into anything anymore. I don't get flare ups anymore. And the other way I can tell is by um, how it feels. You know, negative thinking feels heavy. It feels intense or urgent sometimes. So the minute I get a, an urgent thought or a heaviness to my thinking, that's another little tap on the shoulder saying, hey, what's up? What are you up to? Where are you going with that? And then as soon as I become aware of it, it just it's moved on and you come back to your innate well-being. Everybody has innate well-being underneath all that stinky thinking. Mm. So this new this paradigm that you've sort of been describing and understanding mm -hmm how you work with women. You mentioned there were sort of three principles, three sort of keys behind that. So if you were to sort of summarize what those three principles look like, how you would, let's say, take someone and work through the three principles with them, what might that look like to someone? Because for coaching, counseling, therapy, for most people being aware of the difference is not something that we do most days you know therapy is a very traditional form counseling is a very traditional form and my belief is always that therapy is very look back and allow you to just look back whereas coaching is look back but use that to move forward so what would these three sort of principles look like in practice well <clears throat> The, the man who put these ideas together, his name's Sidney Banks. He was Scottish, but he ended up in Vancouver in, in the 70s. Um, and he called them principles because they are that. Like if you look up the word principle in the dictionary, it will say like a fact that's true throughout the universe. So if you were to boil down everything from Freudian analysis to NLP, CBT, DBT, EMDR, EFT, BBC, ITV, you know, right, whatever you know, an you know, acronym you want to come up with, you will come back to mind, thought, and consciousness. Because without those, you like if even if someone wanted to argue with me that it's not true, they'd have to use their mind, thought, and consciousness to do that, right? So when I'm working with clients, the, the work is very much conversational. And we talk a lot in analogies and metaphors because that's the language of, of, the, of the spirit. You know, it's um, just the best way. And, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of taking my clients back into the past because A, the past doesn't exist. And mm. there's no healing there. In fact, going back to the past, feel, that's when you're gonna get that heavy feeling and that intensity. And then my body's gonna start screaming at me. So I don't do that, right? It's, we're not in denial. I'm very clear about the things that happened to me, but looking at them from a better frame of mind, um, they're, they're not going to give me that intensity. So the analogy I would use to, to really answer your question is, um, I came up with this one when I was trying to explain this to a friend of mine who is a caterer. So it's, it's a food analogy, which works for most women, right? So imagine you had a bakery, right? And are you in England? You're in London? Uh, not in London, but yes, in the UK. But um, right. I used to be in restaurants. I used to be a chef. Okay. A so I'm keen to hear this analogy. <laughs> right. So let's say you had a bakery in, I, I don't know, in, in uh, Manchester, right? And you you would probably need to order the same basic ingredients over and over, flour, egg, sugar, oil, salt, right? And with those um, basic ingredients, you could make uh, Victoria sponge and Eccles cakes and Bakewell tart and all the wonderful things that, you know, like English bakers would make, right? Crumpets, right? Now, if you were a Mexican baker, 
you would need to order flour, egg, sugar, oil, salt, and you'd be making tortillas. Here in Jerusalem, they're ordering flour, egg, sugar, oil, salt, and they're making challah and babka and rugula and all these wonderful things we have here. If you're in France, you're making gatos and crepes and you're ordering flour, egg, or sugar. New York, you're making donuts and, and bagels with the same basic ingredients. So there are millions of bakers all the way around the world and with those basic ingredients, they're making billions of different baked goods. So mind, thought, and consciousness are the basic ingredients of how we experience everything. So even if your therapist is taking you into the past and you're feeling miserable, you're doing that with mind, thought, and consciousness. The same as if you're sitting on the beach thinking about a, a fantastic project you're going to do when you get home. It always comes down to mind, thought, and consciousness. And what I found is now that I understand how experience is created, I don't need all those tools and techniques anymore. Because if I understand that thought is always moving, mm. then using a technique to understand it is like, imagine thoughts are like trains. It's like dragging the train back into the station to work out how to make it leave. Well, <laughs> it already left. So, I don't get frightened now if I have a funky thought or a criminal thought or an inappropriate thought, because we all do, we all get a funky thought, right? It's just part of being human, but so what? It's gonna move on. It's not who I am. It doesn't mean anything about me, unless I think it does. Mm -hmm. And that usually happens when I'm in a low mood. So that would be consciousness. My consciousness is going up and down all the time. It's normal and natural to go up and down. So if I were to tell you about those muggings that happened to me, from a low mood, I'm crying, you're crying, it's gonna be a disaster. Whereas in a, a better state of mind, I can tell you in quite gory detail the things that happened to me in front of a crowd of a thousand people at a conference. And it's not gonna affect me, I'm not in denial because my perspective is coming from understanding, possibly even compassion. Because when any human being in a better mood is going to be more open-minded, more flexible, more forgive. We are forgiveness. I don't need a technique for forgiveness when I'm in a good mood. In fact, it doesn't even matter that somebody, you know, hurt me. I'm just, I can understand they, they were having a hard time, mm. right? Now, that might be sound very idealistic, but, but I, to be honest, we all go up and down. And so um, when I know that my thinking, um, my 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 moods rather are a, a reflection of my thinking they're letting me know like the pain is letting me know I'm in a real stinky thought mm. my mood also is letting me know that mm. I used to be terrified of my moods and now I see that if I'm in a funky mood it means the quality of my thinking is heading towards you know the basement and I probably had no business listening to it <laughs> okay the way that you talk about the the consciousness is I suppose the difference between having an angry thought and being an angry person. When we allow the thoughts to start to dictate our identity, I am the kind of person who's always afraid. I am the kind of person who always is rejected rather than we all have thoughts of fear. We all have a thought where we yeah. will feel a certain way. That thought will be in a certain frame, yeah. but it's not allowing that to dictate our consciousness as it were that was your word um yeah I mean that's one way of saying it I mean the other point I would want to make is that everybody has innate well-being mm. like nobody is garbage nobody is rubbish right so when we feel that we are worthless or we messed up again or you know that that, that life is too scary and anxious then I can see now that that's just the thought I'm feeling in that moment. It's not who I am. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, like, I, I know I've got some candlesticks here on my, my mantelpiece, right? So those candlesticks can get dusty and dirty. Now, if I didn't understand dust and dirt, I think I have to go buy a new set, right? Mm -hmm. I'd have to keep going buy candlesticks all the time. But hey, you can clean them, right? The, 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 the shiny silver stuff or gold, whatever it is, is underneath. Like, that's why I like, um, clouds are a really good analogy for this. Like thoughts are like clouds. They're constantly passing and we are the blue sky. And even if there is the worst rainstorm and like, you know, thunder and lightning, um, we have terrible storms here in the winter because we're up a mountain. And I, I lived in Manchester for, for many years when I was in university. And, you know, it's 
I learned all about rain there. <laughs> There's all different <laughs> kinds of rain yeah. in Manchester, right? Now, if you didn't understand um, weather cycles, you might think that, you know, this is the thunder and lightning and storms. But when you understand that storms always pass, and mm. it's, it's going to move on, you, you don't have to order blue sky from Amazon. The blue sky is there. It doesn't, didn't go away. We are mm. the blue sky. So even if we get caught up in our thinking, which we all can, if I can hang on to that grounding that I know it's going to pass, that whatever I'm thinking is not me, it's just an illusion mm -hmm. I just bought into for a few minutes or days or weeks or decades, if you think about mm -hmm. my teens, right? Then I know I can come out the other side of it, which brings hope, which makes it move even faster. And you come back to your innate well-being really quickly. Like that, and that's resilience. Everybody has resilience. Mm. Just sometimes we don't think we do. And then we're thinking our feeling our thinking again. Yeah. So if the thoughts are the clouds that are moving past, mm -hmm. and the consciousness is our perception of the clouds, essentially. We perceive that cloud to always be there, therefore we're always yes. in that low. Yeah. So our consciousness is our perception of the cloud. Mm -hmm. Because these are all quite esoteric words that, you know, mm -hmm. all the three principles. So that leaves us as, with the last principle, mind. which is the mind. Right. So what is the difference between the mind as opposed to the consciousness and the thought? Right. I, I'm loving your questions. Um, so, <laughs> so mind, when I first came across these ideas, I, I wondered like why Sid, uh, why he called it mind, because um, like you said, they're very esoteric things. So why didn't he call it, you know, wisdom or grace or, you know, essence or something like that. And then I realized he kept, he would always talk about universal mind. These are universal principles, right? Um, and universal intelligence. So what he was pointing to was that source of everything. Now, some people call that God. Some people call it higher power. Other people can call it wisdom, intelligence of the universe. It, it really doesn't matter what you call it. As long as I, I started to see that there was some loving source that was taking care of me. Mm. That even in the times when I felt like um, I, I'd wake up, I mean, in the depths of my PTSD, I had PTSD for like 10 years. And mm. I'd wake up and I'd cry for hours and I still didn't have a reason to get out of bed. Mm. And even in those worst times, um, I was taken care of whether you call it a guardian angel or, or you just call it, um, I don't know, um, fate, doesn't really matter what you call it, you know, um, it, there's something taking care of us, unless I don't think there is. And that's usually when I've got caught up in my thinking, I kind of feel disconnected. But when I know that I can never be disconnected, in fact, they, these are, we kind of giving them different names, but they're, they're, they're not separate things. They're all kind of merge, you know, there's a universal loving intelligence that is already making my heart beat and digesting my lunch and giving me um, my neurons in my brain are working so I could speak and talk to you guys, right? There's some kind of intelligence in that system. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed by talking to a lot of people with anxiety for many years now, whether it's health anxiety or just general anxiety, social anxiety, there's different driving anxiety, <laughs> there's all different kinds of names for it, um, versions. What if I knew it's all the same thing? What if I knew it's just a misunderstanding of how this all works? And then we get frightened and I've forgotten that there's some loving intelligence that's there to take care of me. So it's not a religious thing. Um, I've, I've, I remember talking to a guy once who was a, a, a physicist and we started talking about uh, physics and how, um, you know, I, I can remember from high school physics class that, you know, everything's made of atoms. And when atoms move very fast, they appear solid. So my phone looks solid. I can tap it, but it's actually made up of a billion zillion atoms spinning around very fast. And that's kind of what happens with our thinking when our thinking starts getting really fast, which is what anxiety is problems seem very real mm. but it's an illusion because when they get a uh, you know those super duper magnetic um microscopes and they like you know look at something solid and they see there's atoms and then inside an atom inside 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 an atom apparently there's nothing it's just energy and so yeah. when our thinking slows down we just come back to love and innate well-being and that's who we really are <laughs>
Well, on that note, I think that's a fantastic sort of beautiful ending for today's episode. And it's been really fascinating hearing your take on how the mind-body connection works and actually the mind being ours, but almost part of something that is more universal. The mind, your mind is my mind. My mind is somebody else's and that mind is there as part of, as you say, religions are institutions that take belief systems. So whatever your belief system is listening to this, it's about understanding that your energy is connected and it is taken care of and it is safe. And it's been fascinating listening to your story from Hollywood to here. Uh, and if people wanted to talk to you more or find out anything more about what you do, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm on Facebook. Um, you can find me on Facebook. I have a group uh, has about 3000 people in it. Um, so just find me and friend me and I can put you in the Facebook group. Um, I have a website. It's my name, Hannah Studley, uh, C-H-A-N-A-S-T-U-D-L-E-Y.com. Um, I have three books out. The first one is called The Myth of Low Self-Esteem. That one's kind of about trauma and set mostly in the UK, um, a little bit in Australia and New York. Um, the second one is called Painless. That one's, they're, they're all novels. They're all uh, like adventure stories because um, I find it's really good to have characters do the suffering and the searching and the happy ending and, you know, so you can follow along with the characters. So Painless is set mostly in Australia, a little bit in, in New York and uh, LA. And then the most recent one is called Very Well. And that one's about hormones because, you know, so many of us have had horm hormone difficulties from PMDD, which is a diagnosis to um, postpartum depression, perimenopause, menopause. When you understand what's happening, like with most things, um, the, the severity of the symptoms can, can go away. So the, the latest one is about um, uh, a woman suffering menopause and her two daughters. So they're all on Amazon. And I have a membership group where I have, um, you know, videos and coaching and stuff. So if you go to my website, all of the information about this stuff is on the website. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much to Hannah for joining us today. And thank you to everyone for listening. And I really look forward to seeing you all on the next episode of the Health Collective Podcast. And in the meantime, have a fabulous day. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>